this is what always happens. So, you know, they start talking, which is what you want to have happen. Okay, so as we get started, there, I thought I'd do this little like Jeopardy thing here for a second, that Southern Idaho is clearly grazing, ranching, and agricultural country, but there are areas in Southern Idaho that have never seen cheatgrass, as far as we know. They're called kapukas. And that's all I'm going to say. If you want to know what a kapuka is, you'll, you'll, you can ask somebody later, okay? <laughs> so this next panel ought to generate a lot of heat, at least in ideas, concerns, and it's how do we get the federal government agencies to coordinate and collaborate better, okay? Sort of like asking how do we get universities to do that. It could be the same issue. We have peop three people who I think are examples of doing that and might have some great insights on how we can bring about that sort of business. The first is Kristen Thomas Gard Spence, Director of Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration, U.S. Department of Defense. I kind of like that title because, you know, with the Department of Defense, once they decide to do something, they go do it in some cases. So sh they, she may have some interesting insights. Then Kim Tripp. National Threatened and Endangered Species Program Lead of the Bureau of Land Management. And then next to me, Chris West, the Director of the Rocky Mountain Regional Office, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So, Kristen, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do wanna thank WGA for the invitation to be here. Um, we have worked, um, the Department of Defense has worked with WGA through our Western Regional Partnership, uh, but we've talked recently about the need for much greater engagement, and so this is a tremendous opportunity uh, for me to talk about some programs that I'm, I'm pretty excited and, and passionate about. Um, so possibly bad on you guys for letting me go first because I could talk about this for a very long time, but I will try to keep it short. Um, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for me to take back some input from some really amazing practitioners that are in the room. I was very excited to look at the invitation list um, and the attendee list because I think there's some really great additional partnering opportunities for the Department of Defense and for the programs that I'm gonna talk about. So thank you for, for the opportunity here. Um, I want to start briefly by just giving you guys a little bit of an overview on, on DOD and DOD's mission and why we have programs that would cause me to be invited to talk on a panel um, at a collaborative conservation roundtable, um, which may seem odd to some folks that DOD would be included in that, um, and then some of the work we've done with, with federal agencies. But first, um, the Department of Defense manages about 25 million acres of land around the country, which is a relatively small amount of land in comparison to Department of Interior as an example. Um, but on that, those 25 million acres, uh, we actively train, test, and operate on a daily basis and have the responsibility for preparing over a million soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, to go do a job that they volunteered to do, and that's not a small task that we have. We also manage more endangered species on our lands um, by density than any other federal agency, um, another stat that folks often find a little bit surprising. Uh, we have over 350 threatened and endangered species on DOD lands. A number of those species only exist on DOD lands. They do not exist anywhere else in the country. Um, so that's a pretty significant natural resource stewardship and management responsibility that we have to do hand in hand with using those lands. Those are not lands that we have set aside for species. Those are lands that we have set aside to do training, testing, and operations. Uh, so we have to find that balance. Um, one of the, the key elements to finding that balance is to work in partnership. That was something that was recognized by the Department of Defense a number of years ago, um, mostly as a result of things that we did that were not terribly great for endangered species or for natural resources. And we discovered that that would shut down our training and operations. And so there was a, a very significant effort to look at how do we do this differently. Um, the, the, 
after a number of different steps that resulted in the creation of a program called the Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program, uh, which stemmed from an authority that we have from Congress, uh, 10 USC 2684A, uh, which allows us to enter into cost-sharing partnerships uh, with state and local governments, uh, with conservation organizations, in order to preserve and protect lands around and in the vicinity of military installations. Um, we can do that for several different justifications, several different purposes. One of those is to promote compatible land use. And so we really like, in most instances, farmers, ranchers, foresters, open spaces, uh, those are lands that are very compatible often with our military training and testing activities. We produce noise, we produce dust, smoke. Um, sometimes those noises are, are small from small arms, sometimes they're big. And a high density of neighbors close to our fence line is, is not typically good for those neighbors, nor is it good for DOD. So one way we can, we can do that is to preserve farms, preserve ranches that are around our, our installations and ranges. The other key element to that authority is to do habitat preservation and natural resource management work. Um, and that is really to address species issues. So those 350 plus threatened and endangered species that we're managing, they don't care where our fence lines start and stop and where other lands start and stop. And so that allows us to work with partners outside our fence line to really do restoration and management work on those lands that aren't owned by DOD to improve baseline habitat for species. And that can be for listed species, it can be for at-risk species. Uh, so the authority is very broad and gives us a lot of flexibility. So that was a program that was developed uh, we got that authority in FYO2, we started getting funding in FYO5, and we've had some great success. Um, through the end of FY18, we've been able to preserve with partners, and I wanna emphasize the partnership piece. We have to have a partner for these transactions. This is not DOD going out and doing this work on our own. This is DOD working with those state and local governments and conservation partners uh, to pr protect these lands in, in collaboration. Uh, but we preserved over 568,000 acres around 106 military installations in 33 states. Um, that's about $1.6 billion of total investment since we started getting funding for the program. And over 789 million of that funding came from non-DOD partners. So we have close to a 50-50 cost share, which is a pretty incredible uh, statistic for us inside of DOD to be able to talk about preserving our ability to test, train, and operate, and doing that at half the cost um, because of the contribution of our partners. So that was a great program, and we did great things with that program, but it is limited. Um, it, it's limited in scope in that it's predominantly an easement acquisition program. We can do restoration and management work um, as an element of that, but it is tied to a real estate transaction. And so we, we realized that working in kind of those donut holes or those buffer areas immediately adjacent to our fence line or immediately beneath airspace and training routes wasn't going to solve the larger problem. Our installations reside in broad landscapes. Um, we are dependent upon broad landscapes, not just for areas that we operate in and above, uh, but for water security, um, for uh, air quality. Um, it's not just that immediate area around the installation. So we started looking at things from more of a landscape approach. And in doing that, uh, we discovered that we really need to be partnering with our, our federal agency partners who have a much broader look and broader perspective. And so we approached Department of Interior and Department of Agriculture um, and started exploring this concept of a federal agency partnership. And that partnership came into being in late 2013, and it's called the Sentinel Landscapes Partnership. Um, and I'll tell a very quick story about kind of how that truly got kicked off. And it's one of these, you know, opportunistic things that happens, and you see it, and you go, wait, we did this on accident. What if we actually tried to do this on purpose? Could we actually get something much more significant accomplished? And my predecessor in the REPI program had the opportunity to do a site visit at Joint Base Lewis-McChord in Washington State, so kind of South Puget Sound area. Um, and she took with her um, an advisor at the time at Natural Resources Conservation Service. And he went with her to see some of the work DOD was doing because NRCS had some easement projects. At that time, it was the Grassland Reserve Program. And they were pursuing some easements in the same area that DOD was, was looking at um, some easements. And those easements were working lands easements, and they were specifically to address endangered species. There are three species at the time that were um, to be listed 
um, near Joint Base Lewis McCord, and they are prairie dependent species. And they, most of that prairie habitat that remains in South Puget, South Puget Sound happens to exist on Joint Base Lewis McCord. Even better than that, most of that habitat on Joint Base Lewis McCord is in the large impact area. And why is that great, great habitat in the large impact area? And I really like Leslie said this this morning, instead of looking at DOD as a threat, instead of looking at a landowner as a threat to species, we have the best habitat in the middle of that impact area because we set it on fire all the time. And this is a fire dependent habitat and these species are fire dependent and therefore we've had the best maintained habitat in the middle of our large impact area. The problem is that we also need to train strikers in that large impact area and we were extraordinarily restricted in the type of training that could be conducted there because those species were also present and we were trying desperately uh, to do everything we could to keep them from being listed and there was a lot of great work that was done and at the end of the day we just that that wasn't possible and those three species were listed um, they were the work that had been done was taken in, into consideration um, and there were a lot of great additional partnering opportunities identified to, to reduce impacts on DOD and we're continuing that to this day but what we went out and looked at was we were actually targeting the same farmers as NRCS for easements to protect species. And out of that visit um, came an opportunity. We had some funds at the end of the year that we were looking to, to put toward that project through a, a challenge competition we have. And NRCS said, well, if you're gonna put this money there, we'll commit to putting some funds that we had at the end of the year there as well. And I believe NRCS um, put forth about 3.5 million. I think we put about 5 million into that. And instead of acquiring the same parcels, we went down our list further so, to some of those properties and were able to protect uh, twice as many acres as we would have been able to protect individually. And that was sort of the catalyst to say, we have more opportunities like this around the country. And that was just with NRCS. That hadn't even, we hadn't even at that point reached out to really think about what role can we have fish and wildlife play in providing some predictability to these landowners in partnership with USDA and DOD. And so that really is what kicked off and started the, the Sentinel Landscape Partnership. Um, and that has developed into a nationwide partnership uh, where we have seven designated Sentinel, Sentinel landscapes um, that partnership is directed through a federal coordinating committee, um, and I want to acknowledge um, NRCS specifically for really being a, a key leader in that from the very beginning. Um, great engagement. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Paul Souza, who's not in the room right now, but Paul was one of the original folks who worked with us on s setting up that coordinating committee. Uh, the Forest Service. Um, and then Farm Service Agency were kind of the original uh, agencies that worked together on that. We've since engaged BLM in that process and we're reaching out to, to other agencies as well, so it's grown over time. Um, last thing that I'll, I'll say about that and then I'll, I'll stop talking about this for a little while. Um, through the end of FY18, and this is an accomplishments report that we're putting together right now, uh, but within those seven designated Sentinel landscapes, since they were designated, we have made an, a combined total federal investment of $328 million, and that's from defense, agriculture, and interior. That has been matched with over $162 million of state, local, and private money, and uh, $58 million in private investment within those seven landscapes. And, and this is all the going back only as far as about FY13 for some of the landscapes because that's when they started. So this isn't a relatively short amount of time. Even more impressive than that is just in that time frame, we've protected over 224,000 acres within those seven landscapes, and we have over 1.6 million acres enrolled in some type of conservation or management practice. A lot of that is in NRCS EQIP, um, but that's also looking at DOI programs and, and other programs within USDA as well. So uh, that's been in, in a short time period that has been um, well, we've, we've kind of used, the, act, or we used the, the description that we've built this plane while we're flying it. Uh, we saw an opportunity, we announced this partnership and we went out with it and then everyone said, oh, this is fantastic, what is it? We said, we're not sure, we're trying to figure that out. Um, and we're still trying to figure out all of the potential this has, but it's been a tremendous opportunity so far and I think um, as we have opportunities to engage with states, 
um, as we have opportunities to engage more effectively with different landowner organizations and NGO partners, many of you represented in the room, I think we can take that partnership to the next level. But it's, it's really been key to um, moving forward so far, the key has been uh, that great collaboration and the shared interest in working collaboratively within the landscapes. And I, I wanna commend Interior and Agriculture for the great uh, partnership that they've displayed. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Again, my name is Kim Tripp, National Threatened and Endangered Species Program Lead in BLM. Um, so as a land management agency responsible for 245 million acres uh, of the public domain with 430 listed species that inhabit these lands, BLM's stewardship responsibility is great and our potential for recovery of listed species is enormous and in some instances untapped. So I've been asked to highlight uh, BLM's recovery fund initiative specifically and how such an effort was built into the broader multi-agency collaboration, wi collaborative wildlife protection and recovery initiative. So the BLM Threatened and Endangered Species Initiative uh, was designed and funded by the BLM and managed through the National Fish and Wildlife Fa Foundation. It awards up to a $1 million annually to targeted key recovery tasks on BLM administered lands and as an, to, as an investment to preclude the need to list a candidate species or culminate in a delisting or downlisting of a federally listed species. This basically was a shift from um, disjointed multiple acts of conservation to a strategic infusion of funding, looking at the end goal of a status change for, for a, re, a status change in recovery of a listed species, and also looking beyond one year fiscal funding cycles. It also took into account uh, the, uh, the advantage that we have in the large scale of land that we manage. And so we selected those species whose distribution is captured 80% or more specifically on BLM land. Clearly our investment in uh, recovery actions for this species would basically be the, the, the primary factor that would move the needle. So since the inception of the Endangered Species Recovery Fund in 2010, BLM has shared in the conservation successes of 32 species, four delistings, three proposed delistings, three proposed downlistings, and 22 preclusions of listing. It's 5% of our um, t and &E program funding on an annual basis with some really, uh, really um, great uh, uh, dividends in terms, of, in terms of benefits at the end of the day. But with the acknowledgement of these successes, it's also clear that there are not many low-hanging fruit when it comes to listed species. Um, these are the most imperiled species in the country. Their fate is fragile and complex, and simple, easy, one-player solutions are few and far between. So our second phase uh, in terms of an approach was to cast a bigger net to identify those species that occur 80% or more across the federal land mosaic so we could collaborate with our sister agencies on strategic investments in listed species recovery. So this is the um, Collaborative Wildlife Protection and Recovery Initiative. And this partnership among DOD, BLM, U.S. Forest Service, um, Nas uh, National Resources Conservation Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and NIFWF was to select a species of communal interest and priority and strategically invest financial and other resources towards addressing its recovery needs. The federally endangered least bells vireo was selected as the first species of interest in Southern and Central California. The goal is to invest in recovery actions to downlist the least bells vireo from endangered to threatened while also benefiting other listed species. Um, several partners have already contributed significant resources to this multi-year endeavor. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, invested to do surveys along the coast. DOD and BLM have contributed respectively to survey in the central and eastern corridors. And larger investments in habitat restoration will occur this fall and through project solicit solicitations administered through NIFWF and funded by BLM, DOD, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, NIFWF is a, a key and primary player in this. Um, 
they basically provide that connective tissue between the agency in terms of operation and financial structure. Uh, we recognize that the value that NIFWF brings to pool, federal, uh, to pool federal funds and match them with state and private contributions, and where partners can make direct investments in federally listed species recovery actions that provide multiple benefits. Um, and we hope to make great strides in this, in, in this uh, species recovery effort for the, in the next couple of years. Great, I'll take it <coughs> from there. Um, I thought it was interesting when I first noticed that I was on this panel about federal coordination and I'm representing an agency that's actually not a federal agency and I've never worked for a federal agency yet we play this really interesting role in coordinating uh, between agencies and amongst agencies to, to get work done across uh, a whole landscape. So I'm Chris West, I'm the uh, Regional Director of the Rocky Mountain, I'm sorry, Rocky Mountain Regional Director of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and I often get this question, so okay, you, I just said I'm not a federal agency, what are we? We are sort of like a federal relative. Uh, we were, uh, you know, the relative who comes over all the time and you say, people say, ask you like, well, how are they related to you? And you're like, I don't really know, but they're family and they come over all the time and they're all right. Um, so that's kind of how NIFWF is. But anyway, we were established by an act of Congress uh, 35 years ago last week um, to support the fish and wildlife conservation across the country. And we accomplished our mission by pooling resources from federal agencies and leveraging them with non-federal partners, be that corporate uh, contributions, be that contributions through states, be that from private individuals or foundations, and uh, use those pooled funds strategically to maximize on the ground impact. Um, well, the, I'm gonna touch on a couple of the points of the, the program in Southern California that Kim just mentioned, which is our, our latest initiative. This is also an approach that we're taking in other places with BLM, for instance, starting to work in the, the Pecos watershed in, in New Mexico and West Texas. Uh, and then also a similar approach to what we do with agencies on other uh, wildlife and natural resource and habitat concerns such as uh, migrations, uh, ungulate migrations in the West where uh, I'm working with BLM, with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, hoping increasingly working with, with NRCS, the Forest Service and the states on addressing uh, large ungulate migration concerns in, in many Western states. So it's a similar approach. This is a great example of how uh, Kim mentioned that word connective tissue. I had written in my notes the word glue. Um, maybe a little bit more sophisticated of, of Kim's, Kim's uh, uh, explanation there, but it's really that, that sometimes uh, a partnership just needs an entity that maybe has, owns the table and everybody comes around and it's not DOD's table and it's not NRCS's table or BLM t BLM's table, but it's, it's a neutral party that has that common goal and also has the goal of being that connective tissue. Um, and, and that being part of our mission is to, to have that effect of convening uh, for, for maximizing effect. Um, so just a couple quick um, uh, highlights of what we did or are doing in California, because this is really a work in progress. Um, so a couple of the, the, the special things that, that NIFWF plays, and, and I apologize for saying NIFWF, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NIFWF being the, uh, the, uh, the, the way we say it, and it's probably uh, one of the most troublesome acronyms, but we're the only group that has it, and the only one, only one that seems to want it. Um, but anyway, we're able to collect funds and pool those resources from different places where DOD or BLM or NRCS may all have similar goals, but may be compartmentalized into uh, authorizations only on certain uh, uh, federally owned lands or in certain places, but yet there's a concern that runs range wide, and the Lease Bells Vireo is a great example of that. And we serve as that depository of funds. We can, we can hold funds, we can then be strategic and work with partners to get those uh, put on the ground um, at the best place for conservation, maybe not always on uh, a military facility or adjacent to, to a BLM or on BLM lands, but really benefit uh, those species that, that all those agencies care about. Um, from a partner's perspective, and, and, and Kristen mentioned this too, we don't accomplish anything um, as much as I might like to think that, that our staff is out there fixing fence or, or removing cheatgrass or, or monitoring elk migrations, no, we don't get to do that. We get to kind of pretend we do that every now and again, but we don't get to do that. Our partners are the key elements in this whole thing. I and mean, without our nonprofit partners, without our state and local government partners, uh, this work wouldn't get done. But 
pooling these funds, running them through programs like the, this program for the Lee Spells Vireo in California and, and others, uh, allows uh, our partners to have a one-stop shop for applying for funds where they might be able to, to garner funds that are uh, NRCS sourced or for, sourced from a private foundation or BLM or DOD and, and really focus their work on what they're best at doing, which is getting that work done on the ground. Um, and spending less time writing and administering uh, federally derived grants, which is anybody who's done that knows isn't, a, you know, the, the most pleasurable uh, activity you could you could take with your time, and, and really not something that most people get into natural resource management to do. Um, so, and then in some cases, we also work with our funders to develop landscape level business plans to guide investments over a longer period of time. We're starting to edge towards that with with some of the work that, that Kim mentioned. Um, and doing that with, with several other partners, NRCS and the Forest Service uh, in particular, and other landscapes around the country. Um, I was going to hit you, Kim already talked about all the different alphabet soup of funds that went into this certain, uh, the C, um, the Collaborative Wildlife Protection Recovery Initiative in California from DOD, from BLM, from the Forest Service, from Cal, uh, Department of Fish and Game, uh, and NRCS are all going in there to focus on, on the Lee Spells Vireo efforts. And, in 2018, we were able to uh, run those, those uh, funds through two existing NIFWIF programs in the uh, Angeles and Los Padres National Forests in California. Uh, we also supported a boots on the ground coordinator in that landscape through the American Bird Conservancy, another partner of ours um, that's us using another nationally funded uh, program through USDA to put in a position on the ground to continue to, to provide that, that regional, regional focus and that landscape focus for the species. Um, so how do we do this prioritization? Uh, this is really, this, this is not smoke and mirrors, this is, you know, the old fashion collaboration, we sit down and we talk about it. And we figure out who's, who's, good, who's got the funds to do what, where are those needs, and how do those marry up, and how, how can we get those funds uh, put on the ground most effectively. Uh, so in California, the first year, the partners uh, sat down, had that conversation, agreed that a habitat model was really what was needed to provide guidance for directing future investments. Um, so that's what we did. So we, uh, we were able to award a grant through the USGS, and that's going to be done this fall. Um, and we really look forward to seeing what the results of the, that is to, to really start to continue to target work down the road. Um, more recently, there's another partner meeting. There's some, you know, it's a bunch of agencies. There's a bunch of meetings, and, you know, we get things done eventually. Uh, but it was apparent that additional capacity was needed to address um, outstanding questions that were, that, that were beyond the habitat model. So right now, Kim mentioned, we're soliciting uh, contracts from one to two additional um, groups that will be uh, put on the ground in May to uh, collect data, develop survey protocols for the species, and better um, assess uh, a, a whole suite of threats, but including one around uh, cowbird uh, nest depredation. Um, so, and then later on this fall, we're gonna launch an R a, a request for proposals to, for, to support range-wide surveys for the bird, um, look at re restoration opportunities on key BLM lands, and a couple of other needs that have been identified by the partners, and that, work is being uh, supported by that entire uh, uh, alphabet soup of agencies that I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, really, we're, as this grows, this is something that, that I, Kim mentions is phase two of, of, this, of this relationship around uh, how do we best address endangered species uh, with BLM, and we're really hoping to um, add additional value to the partnership by attracting private funds uh, to this effort. This is one of the places where uh, NIFWF really can provide some magic in marrying up sometimes pretty restricted federal funds uh, with, with uh, private corporate, corporate contributions or, or, or uh, foundation contributions that uh, really allow, uh, unlock some of the, uh, some of the uh, restrictions that may come with federal funds and really allow our partners to get that work done on the ground more easily. So we're really looking forward to bringing some private funding into this mix uh, as we go forward as well. And I'll stop there, and I think, uh, John, you're going to have some, some questions for us. So we'll keep talking. There aren't surprises. No. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, guys. Let's, we, we do have some formative questions to get it started, and then I'll bet there's questions out there and thoughts about this, because we sure had them this morning in our, our sort of pre-workshop. But since this is the Western Governors Association, a question about the West, 
Um, it's supposed to be for Kristen and Kim, but, but certainly, Chris, you can weigh in. You both manage programs that are nationally focused. Are there any distinct challenges that you've encountered with projects in the West compared to similar efforts in other parts of the country? <laughs> well, I can share that, you know, BLM is predominantly in the West. We have a few fragments of land holding on the eastern side of things, but mo most of our land is, is sizably in the West. I would say that the distinction in the West is that the, the, the scale of, of federal land holdings are, are probably a lot larger, um, but yet the capacity to address or, or manage those large-scale lands is, is pretty, pretty small. And so there is this great need for collaboration and partnership to even work on, on, on a federal land specifically. Um, and so that's where I see the biggest distinction, whereas, you know, the mosaic of federal lands across the east might be a lot more, a lot smaller and collaboration is happening across many different, uh, many different jurisdictions, but you might have broader, uh, broader scale of lands on the federal side, on the western, on the west, um, and you actually have to have our partner, uh, have to have our federal folks actually encourage and, and find opportunities to bring those partners e to invest even on the federal lands themselves. Yeah, I, I would agree. Obviously the land ownership uh, structure in the West is drastically different than what we have in the East and in the Southeast. So DOD does a lot of work in the Southeast and we do a lot of work in, in the West and the Southwest specifically. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest challenges in the West is that we're really dealing with uh, what I would describe as kind of three primary land owning entities that, that we have to collaborate with in the West, and it's federal lands, state lands, and then the private lands. Um, and the state lands, uh, particularly those state trust lands, pose some significant challenges uh, for, for partnering and engagement because of the, the, the way those lands are laid out many times in that checkerboard pattern with federal lands um, that can pose a really uh, difficult challenge working with, across federal agencies um, on especially collaborative natural resource management is one thing and there's obviously challenges with that and, and we've talked about some of those and we'll talk about more of those. Um, engaging private landowners is something that uh, particularly the programs that, that I oversee in DOD is intended to do. We specifically, our funds are specifically to engage uh, with state and local governments and work on private lands. Um, our funds typically are not available to be used on federal lands. Uh, that becomes a challenge of, of the appropriations authorities that the different federal agencies receive. We can't take our DOD funds and invest them on other federal lands without specific authorities and permissions from Congress. And so that it creates a situation in which we're trying to, to bring some dollars and investment to the table, but we have to be specific about where those dollars can be placed. Um, the state lands pose an entirely different type of challenge. In many instances, um, they're managed, uh, there's a fiduciary responsibility uh, by a state lands office to manage those for profit for, for the state, to fund schools, to, to fund other state programs. Um, and they have a, a profit driver, and that's their mission, and that's their focus. But that mission and focus is not always in line with or compatible with um, the conservation efforts that we're trying to pursue. And so looking at how you work across that checkerboard pattern and how you bring the right folks to the table um, and dealing with uh, challenges on conservation easements and, and the views of perpetual land protection. Um, there's, there are different perspectives on whether that is, is good or acceptable um, in the West that differ somewhat from, from the lands that we're dealing with in the Southeast. You just have a different mindset there. And so those, uh, there are some tremendous opportunities and I think Kim did a great job of highlighting that because you do have multiple federal agencies we're very dependent upon one another and I think DOD uh, more so uh, I'll, I'll say that on behalf of the department than some of the other agencies uh, we use a tremendous amount of BLM land in the West um, we withdraw that land for military purposes some of those are lands that we've withdrawn for a very long period of time um, permanent you would you would look at it in that context. Um, sometimes we're doing activities across those lands on a temporary basis, and so we're dependent upon those relationships and that collaborative uh, conservation work that we can do, um, but the, the dynamic between private land ownership and state land ownership in the West is, is very different than what we contend with in the Southeast. 
Yeah, uh, I'll just add one little. Um, so the, the office, the, the Rocky Mountain Regional Office, was formed only four years ago, and I was part of a uh, look <coughs> internally at NIFWF on where we were doing a lot of work and where we maybe may not have, where there may have been some gaps. And the Rocky Mountain West really stood out. And I think that one of the things that's been a little bit of a challenge is just working within a national organization. And it's the exact same reason that Western governors exist is that there just are fundamentally things about the Western landscapes and Western resources that are different. And a big part of my job is either to be a regional explainer or a regional cheerleader sometimes within a national organization of like, this is really important here, here's why. And understanding, it has taken me a little while coming from working just within the state of Colorado for 20 years that there are people out in the rest of the country who simply, not, not because of anything other than they have not been exposed to it, just simply don't understand the fundamental difference on a lot of Western resource issues. So once I got past that, my, uh, the, the big part of the job's gotten easier realizing that the, the part of being, being a Western representative is being a, an explainer and a cheerleader at the same time. I had one other follow-up yeah, to just sure. offer. Um, I'm glad that Kristen brought up the whole checkerboard pattern. <clears throat> I think that as what I was saying is that there is this accustomed or, or comfort in, in working through these larger scale areas. And I can say that when we have queried our folks to identify species, we typically have shied away from those species that fall within more of that checkerboard mosaic because there's a difficulty in trying to figure out how you necessarily engage with all of these multiple entities. And I think that um, through time, there will be, I think it will be helpful with partners and, and maybe the acumen that NIFWF brings to bear to figure out how we really can start looking into those, uh, those mosaics and not be as, as hesitant to do so, because I think that we're kind of avoiding certain opportunities because it just looks too complex. Um, the next question, but I'm going to back up for a second because I can weave into it. Kristen, you brought up a very interesting thing that I think in these issues, a lot of times people, or at least people who want to get into the issue, don't know is the mission and mandate of state land agencies with that trust responsibility is very different than multiple use. And if, unless it's a state park system, it's very, it's very not well understood that they cannot do certain things because that's not their legal responsibility in terms of what they're supposed to do first. Without telling my BLM story again, I'll just suggest that if you go east, they don't know who BLM is, period. They have some clue about the national park system and forest, but it's, it's a bit of a pull there if you're trying to talk about some of these issues. But with that, as it was sort of an intro, especially the, the trust point. This is a very key question, and there's not a clear answer. And Kim, you may be even a little constrained to honestly answer it, and that's very <laughs> fine. But do you agree that coordination and collaboration outside of agency silos is something that needs to be organically developed and brought along through agency culture and leadership change? That's pretty profound in terms of how you get agencies to work together, I think, better. So anybody that wants to tackle that, and again, there's no right answer to it. Well, I'll, I'll start. And I think this is, uh, we've had a unique opportunity in the context of the Sentinel Landscape Partnership to some extent because of how that partnership sort of came into being. Um, and it, it, it didn't just magically appear as a result of some, some opportunities that existed at Joint Base Lewis McCord, but was the result of a lot of folks thinking about how can we look differently at landscape scale conservation and how does DOD fit in that? Uh, because DOD um, is a little different than, than the other agencies and we have these pinpoints on a map and then we have space that we operate above where those pinpoints are, and then we have operations that occur between those different pinpoints, and some of that's on the ground and some of that's in the air, but we're still very dependent upon landscapes that we don't own or control in any way and have to, to work with others in that. But we also realized, and, and this was very much a conversation amongst the federal agencies early on in the partnership, that if we truly want to be successful on the ground and achieve outcomes that matter, it has to be organically driven. We, the federal agents, and we, we had hours and hours of dialogue about this at the federal level. Do we, as the federal agencies, in initiating this partnership, pick 10 places that we think are really important 
call them sentinel landscapes and then try to drive from the top down actions on the ground that are going to achieve outcomes. And we all looked at each other and said, we've tried that a whole bunch of times and we don't usually succeed. So instead, how do we work to enable um, the local partnerships that are already, they have a passion and they're pulling together and you've got these multiple agency collaboratives happening organically. Can we identify where some of those are? Can we pool our resources and direct focus those resources at those places that are already starting this work? Um, and help them really get it going and get it off the ground. Um, some of that was through, honestly, we, we couldn't pool resources necessarily in all those places. We do have an authority now that allows for DOD funds to be a non-federal match to um, conservation programs in Department of Ag and Department of Interior, which has made a big difference in some of the work that can happen on the ground because those programs require a match and our funds can be that match um, where that works out for everyone. But we didn't necessarily have that at the beginning. Um, and so we were just coordinating on the ground where we could apply those dollars and then trying to be a bit more efficient about how we made those programs available to landowners. And, and I'm not saying that we're doing that well yet, but we've recognized that one of the big challenges, and this is part of letting this develop organically, and making ourselves at the federal agencies available to those local partners to say what's working and what's not working. What we think we have these great programs that provide tremendous resources and enable you to do good work and they go, yeah, kind of, but they're really hard to use. Or landowners don't like them, they're very confusing. Or there's too many steps in the process. And I, I'm not purporting that we have fixed any of that, um, but we have identified where some of those challenges exist and have found those opportunities nothing that we could identify as the federal agencies sitting in Washington, D.C. That stuff all had to come directly from those partnerships at the local level who are really implementing these things on the ground to say, we got this done, but gosh, guys, it would be a lot easier if you didn't make us go through five different appraisal processes to put one easement in place. Um, and so trying to identify those streamlined places. The other thing I'll, I'll say briefly is you have to decide to invest in capacity. So if, if there were two things about kind of what I think we've been able to do successfully in Sentinel Landscapes, one is we have stayed true to that commitment to allow these partnerships to develop organically and support them from a national level, but we have also made a commitment to invest in capacity. Um, and uh, about two years ago, uh, we entered in, DOD entered into a, a partnership with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. They matched us dollar for dollar, um, and we have a pot of $1.2 million to fund capacity, so people on the ground in those landscapes, and we now have Sentinel Landscape Coordinators at all seven of those landscapes who are dedicated to leading that collaboration and working in the agencies because everyone has a day job and assuming that one of the federal agency partners or one of the state partners could take the time to be the coordinator for that entire collaborative was just not realistic. Um, so that I think those two things, that organic um, development and then the investment in capacity are really key to that success. I'll just echo a couple of things there, uh, Kristen, too, that the, the um, that I've noticed is, is the, if you, as soon as you force these things, they're almost destined to make them not happen. Um, and a partnership has to, has to come around for, for some compelling reason, and that's this organically driven. Um, but I also wanna make a point that, that one of the things that's really hard, especially with the agencies in terms of where their staffing is right now, is that nobody's got extra time to devote you know, a couple hundred hours a year to developing a partnership, um, or at least at least very few people do, and that's maybe one, one of the reasons that, that a dedicated person who wakes up every day and says, my job is to make sure that the Sentinel landscape uh, effort at Fort Huachuca in Arizona is going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that is something that, that is really hard to put on to a career employee or somebody else who's already got, you know, 120% of their time scheduled out uh, through the year. Um, so it's, I think both of those things need to happen, but I think also it's important for the agencies when the successful ones is to see that the agencies are giving their employees the room to do this and that, that sometimes these things are different. They don't fit nicely into protocols. They don't fit into the way we've always done it. And that can be an, an impediment for a lot of, a lot of uh, especially younger and, and local staff to, to say, well, it's never been done that way before, so 
sometimes that can be the end of the, the end of the question. And I think that the leadership from the agencies can be to say, we know that there's going to be some of these places where we're going to need to develop something different. And, you know, we encourage that growth, uh, you know, figure out what those are, and we'll see if we can get them done within the agency. Um, and I also think there was one other point in there that, that you made, Kristen, which was about this almost like a, a translator role for, for some of our partners or for NIFWIP at times to be a translator for our federal partners and saying, you know, here's, here's why there are five different uh, appraisal review uh, processes for, for this. And um, maybe part of the role would be to take the, the litany of, of, uh, of concerns from the partners and, and then bundle those together and then sit down with our federal partners and say, okay, this, was, this worked pretty well. It could work really well if we just were to change these two, these two requirements. And, and, and you know, that, that's where this, the collaboration, I think, starts getting, getting uh, exciting when you, can get, when you get feedback both directions. I had said earlier that, um, that, there are, that one, one player solutions are few and far between. So I think that you know, working across silos is absolutely imperative. As far as um, whether things need to be organically driven, I think that that's typically where things, uh, how things happen, and there's definitely extreme value to that. The one thing that I think sometimes um, affects the the value of it is that you know organically driven is usually created by oppor opportunism. There's there's an opportunity to do something. A group of folks have a particular interest, have a particular alignment. But if you step back, sometimes those things that are being invested in aren't necessarily the key priorities of that area, aren't the highest contentious issues, aren't the ones that necessarily have to be addressed because those are more complex, and they don't necessarily easily align with one another. So there not, might not be a, a clear oppor opportunity to address it. It actually is going to take additional effort. And so I think that there's, there's that level where, you know, from where I sit at the national office, one thing that I, I have um, stressed to our offices is to step back and do a prioritization uh, across all sorts of different factors. I don't prescribe to them what those are. They generate it themselves, but then they start looking at each one of the species across these across these factors and then they determine which ones really are the ones they need to invest the most in and then at that point then start start moving forward on it so i think that there's there's that play back and forth that needs to be reconciled with what just basically kind of organically um, is created versus things that maybe have to be somewhat um, designed ahead of time Okay, so a related question, and again, we're, we're going to make an assumption here that um, we're, we're talking about agency culture and, and really agency design in some ways. And the question is, um, do we need to make an effort to influence agency cultures with some kind of policy or guidance to help facilitate a more collaborative approach to meeting agency missions. In other words, all of your impressions and experiences probably are you've worked with great agency folks that are very collaborative, then they leave. Or um, you run up to people that just don't get this collaborative business from, for whatever reason. They've never seen it. They they're, happen to be managers, but they're not good with people. Um, in other words, and there's always a danger, though, to try to go to the policy or guidance approach because that has its own problems. But, and maybe it's something that the, uh, the outside community has to, has to talk about more because the agencies can't. But do we need to do that? Do we need to talk about ways to promote a different, I guess, cultural worldview within an agency about being collaborative? because I don't think it's there yet. We've certainly seen a lot of progress over the last 20 years. That was the other part of the question. I sort of paraphrased it a little bit, but what do you think about that? I mean, more than just organic, in other <laughs> words, Kristen, does it need to be stronger? Um, so I do, I very much agree with the point that, that Kim made. It is a fine balancing act of, of enabling and supporting those things that organically develop, but 
those of us who are engaged in these programs on a day-to-day -day basis have leadership within our agencies that, that want to see how is this initiative addressing my strategic priorities. And so there is the, the, the balancing act of enabling and supporting the orga organic development, but then also figuring out how does that align with strategic priorities and, and how can you help to enable and support organic growth in areas that better align with strategic priorities. And so I, I, I do want to acknowledge that, that that is something that you have to pursue. Um, I think on the, the policy and, and guidance perspective, um, and I'll speak from, from the DOD uh, side of things. We, we love policy and guidance in DOD. There's nothing DOD loves more than developing a directive or an instruction and telling everyone how to go suck eggs. Um, but uh, on, the, on the same, and, and we're a very chain of command driven agency. We take orders from the top down and you, you salute the flag and go do what you're, what you're told to do. Um, that's, a, that's a challenging dynamic when you're engaging with agencies that often have a complete inverse of that structure where a lot of the authority and leadership is derived at the local level and those ideas get pushed up the chain. And so that's, it, that's a cultural dynamic that exists between DOD and some of our federal partners that, that can be hard. And until you recognize and acknowledge that, um, it can be very difficult to, to work together. Um, there's a pacing issue in that culture as well. And, and someone alluded to it earlier, DOD, Sets a, a, puts an action on the ground and then we go out and we get it done. Um, and sometimes we wanna do that faster than our partners are prepared to do that. Um, not because they don't want to, but because they have their own administrative and bureaucratic hurdles that they have to get over. Um, and so that's been a, a pretty significant um, lesson that we've had to learn within within DOD um, on that front. And you, you don't address that through, through policy and guidance per se. Um, I do think that's really a, a, something you have to learn, in many instances, the hard way. Um, you have to realize that You've got to sit through the four-hour meeting to end with the same map you started with because the process it took to get back to that same map that you started with got everyone to buy into the fact that that's exactly where we should be working, and now we all agree why we're working there. Um, and, and that comes from a lot of personal experience sitting in meetings where we spent four hours talking about the same map. Um, but that process was worth it, and the outcome of it was worth it because you end up with a product that everyone can agree with. Um, with specifically within the REPI program, we do require projects that come up through the REPI program. One of the key evaluation factors in those projects, and I, I think you know, NRCS isn't represented here, but I know the Regional Conservation Partnership Program evaluates some of the same factors. One of those is holistic planning, and so because the REPI authority that we have in that work is very specific. It's a specific tool that you can apply. It is one piece of the puzzle. It cannot be the entire solution. And so if a project comes forward to us that is purporting that they're gonna solve a, a problem with that single tool, that project's probably not gonna get a very high evaluation. It's very unlikely to get funded within DOD uh, because we need to see how that fits into this broader context. And so that's one way um, when you have money and you can hold money and hold people accountable to a process by telling them they can get money or not get money, you tend to get folks complying with what you've asked for. Um, and so that's been one way that we've been able to push into the culture, at least through REPI projects, that that project has to be part of a broader collaborative effort that needs to address what else is going on at that regional scale in order to get funding to advance that specific priority. Anybody else want to offer thoughts? I'll just jump, jump in. I, I, mean, I think that the cultural changes within the agencies are happening. I think I don't, don't want to sell anybody short the changes that have happened in my professional career and where, where agencies are now and, and, and looking externally a lot more, I think, has is, is been impressive. So I don't, don't, this isn't a, this isn't a, I mean, where's Jeremy? Where's the, the glass, glass three quarters full kind of, <laughs> kind of view on this? Um, but. Um, and I, I also would worry a little bit about the, sort of the unintended consequences of policy directives about thou shalt do, uh, uh, shalt thou shalt collaborate. <laughs> and he's sort of like, oh my gosh, what kind of what kind of nightmares could come from thou shalt collaborate um, <laughs> sort of directives that come down? Um, and I think just um, a couple of other things. One is just the recognition that every collaboration, every partnership has its its own character, and that might take 
the meeting that takes eight hours to come back to the same map that you got to. It might take that realizing that DOD is going to move a lot faster than, than some other agencies are going to, going to want to. Um, and each has, each has that. And, and then trying to say what, what really worked in Gunnison, Colorado is perfect for going over to Salmon, Idaho. Well, it might be, but I would gather that most likely not. Um, so that just realizing that, they're, that these are not cut and paste things and each of them is going to have that own, that, that uniqueness to it and that culture, that the agencies need to, to have that realization built, building into their culture and I think that's happening. And then one other thing that somebody mentioned was turnover, which I think is a really big problem in terms of, of, of keeping momentum, of keeping uh, some of these going, especially in the early days of, of a lot of uh, collaborations. It might be one or two or three people and somebody gets to retirement age or somebody gets put on detail or somebody mm -hmm. gets transferred to, to Idaho and they're no longer working on something great in Colorado, um, that can be really problematic for, for, for seeing some of these things actually take off. Yeah, I, um, you know, relying on policy will not ensure longevity at all and I, I think the, the key is to indoctrinate it in terms of culture and, and practice. I mean, that's where you're gonna get the endurance of any uh, 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 of that type of um, te uh, that type of approach within an agency, I think that's the most important. Um, I had a few thoughts, but I guess when we talk about you know individuals and, and trying to figure out what the skill set is with an individual, I don't know if we can go down that far. I don't think that everybody, every person, is going to be a Renaissance person, so to speak, where they're going to be st really strong in one thing and totally uh, conversant in another. But I think that it's really important that whatever kinds of, uh, whatever teams that are assembled, whatever skill sets that are brought to bear from a particular agency, that somebody has to have that skill set as their strength to bring to the table. Um, I don't think that you know everybody to the table that can be a partner, but doesn't necessarily have the strength and the other technical expertise is necessarily going to get to the end goal either. So I think it's really important to try to figure out what does the ultimate assemblage of the working group look like and, 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 and what are all the skill sets that are brought to bear in, in that capacity. Great, thank you. Okay, time for questions. Um, I know this. we talked about this a lot this morning, so I assume hopefully some people want to eat, uh, bring up some of the stuff we did or get other people to hear it and so forth. Hi, uh, my name's Sharon Friedman. Um, I was really impressed, Chris, to hear about all the great and maybe boring and under underappreciated things that NIFWIF was doing. Um, how broad is the um, how broad is the is the scope of NIFWIF? Does it extend? I mean, because it could be a model for water or invasive species or recreation across lands. How far do you actually go in doing these great things? Well, okay, so <laughs> how broad? We, so we, we are a national organization. We have about 55 different programs which spread from coral reefs to black-footed ferrets to uh, uh, orcas in, the, in, in, in California fire and, all, and everything in between. So um, how far do we range geographically almost everywhere that, you, that there's a resource concern, we either have been, are, or could be involved. I think the kind of the limitation is a little bit thematic in that it really has to have that fish and wildlife and their habitats connection. So could our approach work for a recreation-based problem? Absolutely. Would it probably be NIFWIF doing it? I don't think so. And I think there's plenty of other organizations who could fill a similar role as a collaborator, convener, um, you know, we also have this uh, financial management and grant making and, and, and metrics and reporting um, uh, machine within the organization that's, that's impressive and useful for a lot of things. But um, we really do try to keep to that uh, habitat and, and birds, and, uh, habitat for birds and wildlife and, uh, across the country, um, fish. Uh, we, we have a big partnership with NOAA and I'm, I'm pretty remiss because it's one of our biggest ones. Um, the Rocky Mountain region is the one region that doesn't have any NOAA connection because I don't touch a, I don't touch a, a, an ocean, and we don't do anything with the Weather Service yet. Um, so, uh, so the answer is we could. I think the model uh, is is there. I think I don't think there's any anything that's that's magic that's only uh, could meaning that could only be done by NIF. If I think that, that we've done a nice job of, of existing in that space when it comes to to wildlife and habitat concerns.
Hi, Patricia Dowd. Um, thank you, panelists, for your thoughts and um, great conversation and for WGA for bringing us together. One of the things we talked about this morning was changes, of in, in, changes in administrations and how that affects um, federal agencies, both from a morale perspective, um, a strategic planning or strategic priorities perspective, and then a budgetary perspective. Um, I'm wondering, Kim, if you can talk a little bit about the president's proposed budget and the impacts it'll have on the BLM and threatened and endangered species. And then can, on the kind of the other side of things of Kristen, if you can talk about what the changes might, opportunities might be presented by the president's proposed budget specifically for the def Defense Department. Sure. Um, so there, I mean, through, uh, through the president's request in the last few years, I mean, there have been proposed uh, cuts pretty dramatic on t and &E conservation within BLM. The ultimate um, budget that was, uh, that was approved basically um, uh, keeps reestablishing the, the older the older levels, um, but you know, based on that's why prioritization within our agency is so important because there are going to be ebbs and flows and, and and impulses of funding and decreases, and so the most important thing that we can do within our within our ranks is really trying to identify that core work and identify clearly what must get done, uh, what will not get done any longer, what, are, what, are, um, what things may be dependent on other resources to finally get done. And from where we sit, that's really what we need to do. Um, we haven't had to address any of those other scenarios so far because our, our funding has been reestablished, but it's something that we face and we grapple with um, every year. So I often get dirty looks or jealous looks or people throw things at me from my federal agency's uh, partners because we, we have typically gotten more money than we ask for from Congress for the REPI program on an annual basis. So only two years out of the entire history of funding for the program did we not get more money from Congress than was included in the president's budget. Um, so I have, I, I don't have the same types of challenges that some of my federal partners have. Um, one of the, and, and I feel obviously very lucky to be in that position. Um, our, our funding has been pretty stable around the 75 million plus mark for REPI over the past several years um, with kind of an incremental increase uh, starting back when we first got funding in 05 at 5 million. So from 2005 to 2019, um, we've increased pretty, pretty substantially and, and have a pretty stable funding level. Um, one of the things that, that we try to do, and I think DOD is in a unique space um, when you're talking about conservation and natural resources because the, the average member of Congress doesn't immediately think of, of DOD when you think of conservation and natural resources. So we can be a, a good target for some of our federal partners or some of our, our NGO partners to say, look, not only does this work benefit conservation and benefit species, but when we do it in these places with DOD as a partner, we're benefiting national defense, national security. And that's a pretty solid argument to make um, with certain members of Congress who may not be inclined to be terribly supportive of conservation and natural resource programs. But when you can leverage DOD in that, um, that can be a powerful tool. The, the other thing that we have tried to do when the opportunity presents itself, and we're asked to provide an overview to members of Congress about what we do in the REPI program, is to specifically emphasize the importance of the other federal conservation programs that we partner with. Um, everyone, it, it's easy to talk about the great things that REPI does and the fact that we leverage other dollars and that for every dollar DOD puts in, we're getting about a dollar from someone else. Well, a lot of those dollars from someone else come from these other federal conservation programs. And those are other federal conservation dollars that are also benefiting national security, national defense missions. And so a lot of times that connection is not made. Um, we provided a number of responses to questions on farm bill programs and whether DOD cared about those programs and we care about those <laughs> programs very much. Uh, we probably do more partnering with NRCS and the agricultural easement programs than any other specific individual federal uh, conservation program and, and they're a significant match for us in many places around the country, not just inside Sentinel landscapes but at 
you know, a number of those 106 project locations around the country. Um, so I think to the extent that there are those opportunities and it makes sense <coughs> to align resources, um, not just DOD as a funding source, but, but I, I tell folks all the time, use us use us to communicate with folks who maybe don't want to hear your conservation message, but may be more open to that national defense message. I had a couple little, yeah, just little things to add on that sure. I've noticed, and it's been really eye-opening in the last four years of, of coming to be a sort of a part of the federal family in, in whatever weird way that, that NIFWIF <laughs> interacts on a, on a, from day to day, but it's, um, there's some really unique challenges that single year funding um, gives to the agencies, and it, and it really gets them into some really odd places um, it, when you're talking about trying to put together a, a resource uh, can, a management vision for, you know, here's what we're going to try to do for five years or 10 years or 20 years, and you're working with partners who are constrained to, to single year funding, it gets, it gets weird, and just I think that's something that is really, um, as a non-government partner for years, how, how do you understand, how do you manage through that? <coughs> Excuse me. And then I think the other one is that recent budgeting has also led to. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Kim, you want to take? <coughs> sure. <laughs> um, I I wanted to. Do you want to? You can go okay. on. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to share too that you know with what Kristen was saying about. Um, uh, you know, basically how, how things are presented. I mean, in terms of the the, the uh, rationale in terms of investing in T&E conservation within BLM, uh, especially in, in uh, this particular environment, we really have been emphasizing that preventative care versus emergency room type of scenario, and that the investment in recovery actions up front actually can relieve regulatory burdens at the end of the day, and that that obviously has some traction the other thing that we also realized too is that you know military readiness is a clear, mm -hmm. clear push and, and priority currently, um, very much so. And so you know I've reached out to Kristen in somewhat of a Jerry Maguire kind of situation, say help me help you, <laughs> you know, and that we can identify that the activities and recovery actions that occur on BLM land also provide some regulatory relief on military installations as well. And so. We, we find opportunities to try to work across agencies also in how to create that or stre strengthen that, that messaging and package moving forward. Right. One thing I'll just to respond to the single year appropriations, a, a few years back, this has been a challenge for DOD when we're working, particularly species issues, and we're looking for regulatory relief or crediting um, for actions that we're taking off installation. And one of the hurdles we kept running up against was we could preserve land in perpetuity and we could provide management funds, but we're limited by single year appropriations. And for Fish and Wildlife to be able to give us the type of credit that we were looking for and the, the predictability we were looking for, they needed to know that there was a long-term funding stream. And so we were able to get an amendment to um, the, the 2684A authority. We also got this amendment under the Sykes Act as well to establish basically stewardship endowments. Now you're not gonna see the word endowment appear anywhere in the legislation, but we can establish and fund a fund up front for long-term management. And that long-term management can be as long as it needs to be in order to achieve the regulatory predictability that we need. And so that's been a, a pretty powerful tool. And it's, it's used in very limited um, scale and scope because it is, it's challenging to put in place those agreements. NIFWIF is, is one of the agreements that we do have using that endowment authority. I'm um, doing some work in the Southeast with red cockaded woodpeckers and we have a project underway in Washington State to do the same thing for the species at Joint Base Loose McCord. But that's one solution set that we've been able to identify to get around some of those challenges, particularly when it comes to species management, is to be able to per put dollars in in a single year for perpetual management if it was needed for perpetual management. I think I got time for one more question. Hi, I'm Mike Brennan. Um, a slightly different capacity question. One of the things that lots of the speakers uh, today have referred to is that there are more opportunities out there to collaborate um, if we see, simply pursue them. Another concept is problems are more readily solved before they become crises. So from an agency perspective, when you have more work to do than you have time to do it, you're underwater and you have a lot of people shooting at you, I think there's a natural management tendency to take the people that you think are best equipped to put out those fires and stack them all on their desks. 
those may also be the people you need or who have the inclination to say, you know, there's an opportunity over there. We just need to pursue it. Uh, if you agree, how do you free up creative capacity from the people that you otherwise are relying on to either get you out of trouble or keep you out of trouble? I think the biggest, you know, I think Paul Sousa said earlier today that, you know, there are the, the have to do's and then the want to do's. And I think that the more that we recognize that this upfront investment in these complex uh, partnerships is a have to do, it becomes a priority. It becomes a responsibility to carve out the time to do it. It becomes a priority to message that we can't do all, we can't, we can't put out all these little minuscule fires currently because they're trying to address things in a broader scale. Now the reality of doing that and all, all the different uh, uh, pressures to alleviate every one of those particular instances, I don't really know, but from where I'm sitting, I see that to be really the, the most important approach. Stop thinking that these are the want to do's or it'd be great if we had the time to do or it'd be great to do the recovery if we have free time. It's, this is where the investment needs to be for that longer term uh, benefit at the end of the day. Yeah, I think I would add one, uh, one thing that has been successful um, for, for me within the REPI program is to be able to demonstrate some specific examples where one, we didn't get in front of a problem, and there, there are plenty of them, and, and usually it has something to do with, you know, we have an airfield and we used to be able to take off and land north and south, and now we only take off and land to the north because there's been development to the south, and we can't take off over those houses anymore. That, that's a, a, a very simplistic example, but that's something that we address within REPI at, at certain times. And most of our senior leaders used to be installation commanders. And when you used to be an installation commander and you were the guy on the ground at that installation, and when you got there, you could train and test in a certain way. And when you left, you had curtailed your operation significantly. They start to recognize that getting in front of the problem is critically important. Um, we've also seen that um, mindset shift to some extent in the context of, of resilience. And I can't believe that I, I haven't said the word resilience yet um, on this panel when it's written all over everyone's uh, top list of priorities in DOD, but I think there is some mindset shifting as we talk about resilience and really thinking longer term and getting in front of issues. And so I, I am seeing, while it's not the complete shift, I completely agree with Kim that we're starting to get leaders to recognize that these things that we would have described as, as the nice to do's and, and great that's great if we can be proactive are looking at those as that's what we must do. We're gonna take some risk in the meantime, and, and maybe we're not gonna invest as much as we should in putting out this particular fire, and we're gonna see what happens, and we're gonna make some investments in, in looking longer term. Um, the other thing, I did get my assistant secretary to ask our undersecretary for more than 24 hours in the day, so I'm still waiting on the response back on that. <laughs> let, me know, let me know when you get that done. <laughs> I'll let you know. Uh, one, one thing I've just been seeing recently also, too, is these collaborations may be a result of there just not being flat out enough people within the agencies to get these things done. The nice, the nice to do's, the really wish we coulds aren't, aren't, there's just not enough people to do that when, when things are literally on fire or, or other things going on. And um, I, I see a lot of these shared positions. Uh, Kristen mentioned uh, shared positions with the Sentinel landscapes where there's somebody who's, whose sole job it is to do this. NRCS has been doing this. We at NIFWF have funded I don't know, untold hundreds of shared boots on the ground positions, but there's nothing to say that those couldn't um, be taken to a higher level in terms of, of responsibilities, in terms of getting somebody who may not really be that great at the day-to-day -day mundane stuff, um, which every agency, I, you also mentioned, every agency needs those people. Let's say, like, get that wrong. If you had a whole agency full of Renaissance people, I just can't even imagine <laughs> what that would look like. Um, but maybe a few of those could be living as part of these collaborations and shared positions in nonprofit positions and in, in maybe even in state agencies or wherever it makes the most sense. So they don't necessarily have to live there. So I th I'm seeing more and more of that. And I think there's no reason that it just doesn't have to be tech type positions that are that are funded as, as shared positions. They could be these larger coordinating and, and uh, you know, bigger thinker type positions that could fill the, be 
accomplished that same way really outside of the agencies. Okay, before we break, it's a 15 minute break. Please join me in thanking this panel and see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. It happens, man, it happens. Come